Welcome to my talk about uh, bypassing firewalls with API to API hacking. Basically, how you can deliver your payloads to second order APIs. And that's a really long title, I know, but hopefully by the end uh, you will uh, understand what I mean. So, who am I? My name is Johan Kalloway. I work for the Center for Cybersecurity Belgium. Um, for those who do not know that, Center for Cybersecurity Belgium is the highest cybersecurity uh, authority in our country, so part of the federal government. So yes, the government is here on this hackfest, uh, but no worries not to uh, keep an eye on you, but basically to encourage you to hack even more. So that's great. So the CCB uh, uh, consists of several departments, uh, one of which is the Cyber Emergency Response Team, or CERT.be, where I work. Um, I do pen testing researching there, but the most important thing here is uh, I do all things related to CVDP, that means the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Policy. And basically, for us as ethical hackers, this is a really important uh, four-letter word because it stands for a new law that Belgium has that kind of protects ethical hackers when reporting vulnerabilities to organizations. So we are the only country in the world that has written into law protections for ethical hackers. Um, for years we complained that we ethical hackers saw vulnerabilities all over the place, but we couldn't report them because it would be against the law, but no more, because now we have the CVDP law. So, uh, thanks. Um, a great amount of work got into that. Uh, special thanks to the legal team from CCB who wrote the whole law. So, uh, yeah. It's, it's really a milestone, we're super proud of this, and uh, we also like to tell you all about it if you visit our booth uh, uh, at the back with the coffee uh, at Barista. So, um, yeah, let's move on. I also teach uh, advanced web app pen testing at Hull West University, where um, this year they start with a cybersecurity uh, education. So if you or somebody you know is interested in getting into the field of cybersecurity, that is a real quality education. Um, and if I still have time, I have uh, I do some ethical hacking and bug bounty hunting. Now, in this presentation, I'll talk about the API infrastructures of the days are basically enabling ethical hackers to utilize the properties of this infrastructure and use it against the infrastructure itself. So modern API-driven applications are most of the time fairly secure. There's web application firewalls and there's secure frameworks making our lives uh, harder. So we'll see how we can maximize this attack surface and apply some novel techniques to reach deep into the application and detonate payloads in hard to find places. So, small introduction on APIs. Uh, APIs are everywhere, and for good reason. They're scalable, they're interoperable, they're multi-client, multi-domain support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, uh, I guess you all know about APIs. So, from modern web applications to really old and legacy and complicated infrastructures, all those services are glued together with APIs via machine-to-machine -machine communication. Now. Especially in large organizations, and these are the organizations that uh, this talk applies to, like banks and governments and ports and airports and transportation, automotive, etc., etc., APIs are widely used. And as a consequence, API security is also on the rise. There's books, blogs, tools, services, startups coming out all the time at a fast pace, even OWASP is having their own uh, dedicated API top 10. So everybody is jumping on the API security bandwagon, and we at CERT.be do so too. So classical web app pen testing techniques are still valuable when you are testing APIs, but APIs open up a whole new can of potential bugs and vulnerabilities, and hopefully this talk will give you some insight in how to navigate these infrastructures uh, protected by web application firewalls. So the roadmap of this presentation, so first off we start with simple most vanilla basic API hacking example, move on to API to API hacking. We'll discover some more attack for surface that you might not have guessed was there. We'll talk about how web application firewalls come into the mix. We'll talk about transformations and how we can use them as a tool. And hopefully at the end everything comes together and we can bypass firewalls with API to API hacking. 
So I'll be using real-world vulnerabilities that have been found in APIs using these techniques. And hopefully, if you later are confronted with secure APIs and you think like, I mean, I can't really find anything on this. It's super secure. The WAF blocks me immediately. There's no injection points or whatever. Maybe, hopefully, you will uh, find some use in this talk. So first off, the most simple example, a uh, single API. So this talk is about web application firewall bypasses, but in this stage it's more about avoiding triggering uh, the WAF. So even in applications protected by a very strict web application firewall and a framework, there are still opportunities to be had for the pen tester. So for um, ease, we'll call this the payload-less approach. So even made a schema of it, so we have an attacker and an API, singular API. And I imagine this is how most, or at least a lot, pen testers experience API pen testing is just one request and one endpoint where you do your uh, burp uh, testing on. So all these requests are structured data objects, uh, can be get parameters, can be a JSON, uh, whatever. And the response will also contain a structured data object. Uh, most of the time it's JSON, can be XML, can be uh, a JSON structured GraphQL query, etc., etc. The type of structured data format is not really important. Now, the first vulnerability I want to show you was a document API, a sensitive document API. And the JSON request body was fairly simple, so we have a start date, an end date, a user ID, and yeah. Obviously, very simple. You could retrieve all the documents belonging to user 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 be created between those dates. Um, when you see that user ID, you think, hey, any user ID? So let's try other user IDs from other users. Obviously, that's the first thing you try, but that would be way too easy. Of course, this did not work. You could only retrieve documents from your own user ID. So how does the system know which user ID is yours and what you have access to? So applications look at the authentication mechanism to do this. And in this case, it was an authoriza authorization bearer token in the form of a JSON web token. So a JSON web token, real fast, consists of three parts, a header, a payload, and a signature. The header says which algorithms are used to create the signature, but the most important part is, of course, the payload, the part in the middle between the dots. And this is not encrypted. This is just Base64 encoded, so you can decode it and see what's in there. What's in a, a JSON web token is not a secret. You can read it, but you can't change it, because if you change it, it would invalidate the signature at the end of the JSON web token, and the server would reject your request. Now, in this payload of this particular application was also the user ID, one, two, three, four, five. So that's a bit of bizarre why it would an application ask for to give the user ID in the request if it's already in the header. Um, but there might be cases where that can be valuable, especially if like roles or uh, maybe uh, authority to retrieve somebody else's documents. So what happened here was that the backend code read the JSON web token, saw what user ID was in there, and compared it to the user ID in the request. And if they matched up, you got your documents, and if they didn't match up, you don't get any documents. So you could try all you want, but the JSON web token was secure. No weak keys, no uh, signature uh, vulnerabilities there. Uh, nothing could be done. The JSON web token was secure. And the user ID, well, you could change it, but it didn't match up with the one in the JSON web token, so you get no documents. And we tried every injection possible in that user ID. We tried messing with the types of data, messing with the integers, put it minus zero, minus infinity, true, false, whatever, tried everything, nothing worked. Unless until I tried something very weird and just deleted the whole key value pair from the request. Now, this is insane, basically, because it worked. Um, the application tried to compare something in the JSON web token, user ID 12345, and wanted to compare that, but the object didn't exist. So, in some bizarre way, this application um, evaluated that condition to true and gave me access to all documents instead of no documents. And 
don't be fooled by how simple this hack looks because this was missed by many pen testers. Because there's no reason why this would work, this is crazy. But if you don't test for it, you'll never find it. So it actually worked. Now, this situation is a whole different situation than if you would put user ID false or user ID null. I mean, then the key exists, but it just holds no value. Uh, very different situation than when you compare something to something that just completely doesn't exist. So to conclude this first uh, simple API uh, payloadless approach, we have a critical bug um, because there were very sensitive documents in that thing, uh, but we do, didn't use any payloads. So there is nothing for a web application firewall to trigger on, no patterns that it could detect. And adding or subtracting specific key value pairs give you unexpected results. So this example is about uh, removing a specific key value pair, but also adding specific key value pairs can give you very bizarre behavior from web applications. I remember, uh, just comes in my head now, where I had one case where if you um, added one very specific key value, uh, only the key basically, the server would uh, return the same response, but all the headers in lower case, where before they were in camel case. And that was the only indication that something was up. So you add one parameter and nothing changes except the headers were lower case. So as it turns out, um, that response was given out by a different server, hence the difference in headers. And uh, at the end of the research, it turns out to be a web cache poisoning between two APIs and then being served by the user. So sometimes it's very subtle that you see that uh, another server is in play. So let's move up uh, the complexity uh, a little bit with API to API hacking. So in today's architectures, APIs are used all over the place. So it's a glue that binds services together. And it allows an organization to scale to national or global-sized uh, infrastructure. It's very common, but little known, that APIs use other APIs too. So in this setup, we have our attacker speaking to one API, the first API or the gateway API, but basically we want to hack the second API. So take a look at this uh, response object. It's just made up uh, for documentation purposes, but it looks simple enough. So we have a user ID, some order data, some delivery nodes, etc. But if you take a second look, you kind of realize that this object represents different facets from the business logic. And if you have a sufficiently large organization, this might come from different APIs. So we have user ID, that's account management. We have order ID, that's fulfillment. We have payment status that might come from some accounting system. We have stock management from a stock management API, and we have delivery nodes being pushed towards some third-party delivery service. So it's not because you see one object that it's also coming from one server. However, this response object by itself holds no information that multiple APIs are in play. So as attackers, we just have to make an educated guess that sometimes it might be the case. So very often, parameters uh, are being parsed, but not directly processed and used. Instead, the parameter value is just forwarded to another API. So what do you mean with that? Let's say you have a JSON request with a number of parameters and so on, and when the backend code parses the JSON and the parameter is needed to construct an API call, uh, call to another API, then sometimes there is no validation that happens on the first API. The validation happens where the parameter is actually used on the second API. So only there, the application on the second API, the application will error out or not. So another practical example is this API that we come across, and it is, was a read-only API that lets you look up different information from resellers from multiple countries. So this one get call, one get call to an API, and what happened in the background that there was a, a get parameter extra countries, and basically it's an array split by the pipe, and for every country code you put in that array, it's not uh, literal an array, but later on it becomes so, for every value el element in there, an extra call would be made to another API. In this case, it was an elastic database. 
well, I call it database. Elastic is basically a document store, so it's a bit of different, but if you're not familiar with Elastic, term database will, uh, will fit just fine, except that Elastic doesn't use databases, but indices or indexes. Um, but yeah, so what the backend code did in this case was basically take the value from that array uh, coming from the extra countries parameters and uh, prefixed a bit of the path towards the second API, then used your user submitted input and then uh, suffixed it with the underscore search, which basically is a command towards Elastic API to say I want to look up some data. So to hack it, we just replace the value from one country ID, in this case MC, and we put a new index name, FR in this case, a document ID that we just made up, and then we put the keyword underscore create, which actually instructs Elastic to turn this read-only database into a writable database. Now, of course, we still have this backend code that tries to suffix underscore search command behind there. So we use the percent %23 sign here, with basically the pound sign, to dump the original search command into the fragment part of the URL and basically let the server ignore that. So yeah, that's a pretty uh, basic XSS, uh, XSS, uh, um, SSRF, server side request forgery. So what happens here was something very typical for this API to API hacking situation is that we get a 200 OK from the first API, but in the response body there is a second HTTP status 201, which basically means the first API says, OK, for me all is good, this request completed without errors, but in the response there is also a message from the second API saying, OK, I created a resource that didn't uh, exist before. So now we created and we turned a read-only database into a writable database. So again, as with the singular API hacking, uh, we have a critical bug in a hardened target. And again, we didn't use any payloads to speak of, of course, underscore create, underscore search can be considered payloads, but these are not payloads that a web application firewall would recognize as being malicious, it's too generic. And we saw some symptoms of this ecosystem of API to API uh, hacking where there are multiple response codes in the, in the body of the response, maybe leaked domain names from internal API. And of course, I use examples where this is very obvious, but in real life, you might be working blind. It might be not the case that you get such verbose error messages. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So. Let's dig deeper into this infrastructure or architecture. First, we saw some singular API hacking with the payload-less approach. We used no payloads, just subtracted something, but adding something would uh, sometimes also work. And next, we saw API to API hacking with very minimal payloads. So now we need to maximize our attack surface. When we consider API to API hacking, it's very obvious we are dealing with two different attack surfaces might be vulnerabilities in API number one, and there might be a completely new set of vulnerabilities in API number two, uh, even other technologies being used, so these are completely two different attack surfaces. But as it turns out, there are actually three attack surfaces here. We have the first API that deconstructs our user data and uses it to construct a call to the second API, and we have the second API with other technologies or a different set of vulnerabilities, but we also have the communication channel between the two, the back and forth between the APIs, and basically that is an attack surface all by itself. This third attack surface might lead to yet another set of vulnerabilities that you as a pen tester should test for. So consider this next real life vulnerability while I'll take a sip of water. Sorry about that. So this was a search API like you've come across a thousand times already. Just three parameters, um, a query a term, a page size, and a page number. And that was all there is to it. And again, this was a well-tested API, um, and nothing worked. This was a framework being used, no injection points allowed whatsoever. Nothing worked. All weird numbers that you might try from the naughty numbers list or whatever, nothing worked. Uh, 
there was always a very generic error. Um, so nothing really worked. So when I tried to find the maximum page size uh, for this endpoint, I tried 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 to see where the application would uh, give up uh, adding items to the page size. And indeed, at 10K uh, page size, the application gave me a very friendly error that this was way too much for the API to handle, so the request wouldn't uh, complete. That looked like same defaults and proper limitations on, the, on that. Uh, on that parameter. So when I tried the exact, uh, I tried to find the exact page size number, so I tried all integers between 100 and 10,000 to know the exact page size instead of uh, grosso modo order of, uh, of magnitude. And a weird symptom was exposed be between the range of uh, two integers the error message that was displayed was of a slightly different size than the others. So that's a bit weird. So what happened here was even though API and API uh, 2, API 1 and API 2 had, all, uh, had both same limits and same defaults here for that page size parameter, what happened was API number 1 had a max page size of 5,000 and API number 2 had a max page size of 3,000. So they both had same limits but they didn't agree on what those limits should be. So what happens if you put the page size of 3001 in this situation? The first API would say, okay, this is less than 5000, I'll construct a call towards the second API, no problem. But the second API says, yeah, but 3001 is too, one too many, so I cannot complete this request, I'll send you an error, a client error, because the server made no error, the client made an error. And what happened was that the first API could not handle this. This was an edge case that wasn't accounted for. So in this case, we see again those symptoms of API to API hacking. You have a 500 server error being uh, issued by the first API. And you have also in the message request failed with status 400, which is a client error. So you have to consider the dual role that this first API is playing. For us as attacker, that's a server but it also acts as the client towards the second server. So we have here, uh, that explains this server error and also this client error. And the first API couldn't handle that request and was so friendly to dump everything it knew about the failed request in a stack trace, along with the authorization bearer header and the API key to which it authenticated to the second API. And of course, as good pen testers, we test the authorization and the API key, and they actually worked, and they gave me complete access to the whole back office of an organization just by using a number 3001. Now, if a hacker comes along to your organization and says, okay, I have here a payload, and I get uh, zero click complete access to your whole back office of your whole organization. You might think like, wow, what kind of complicated payload you need to establish that. But basically, it's just a number 3001 that can do this. So this is, this is actually crazy. And this is why I love pen testing and hacking. It doesn't always have to be super complicated. Sometimes it's just a number that gives you the keys to the kingdom. So to conclude, this stage is that we again we have a critical bug, and not a real payload was used in the in the strict sense, just a number 3001. Uh, again, we are not bothered by the web application firewall because there is no pattern to trigger on 3001. Is just a real benign user input. Um, again, we have these domain names, these multiple status coders um, that uh, uh, kind of uh, tell you that there is some API to API communication is going on. And uh, arguably, I know it's not super correct, but are you arguably there are no real vulnerabilities in API 1 or API 2, at least no, no real severe vulnerabilities. The severest is basically the verbose error logging from API 1. But it still triggers a very critical bug. So just comes to mind, I know of a story from years ago, there was this hacker called, uh, I think, uh, the Doggy G, Tommy DeVos, who used this kind of bug to basically um, exploit the betting site. So he placed a bet 
so high that the betting side said, yeah, okay, we like money, we'll take your bet of 50K. But the payment gateway said, yeah, but this is too much money, we don't take it. And they sent some obscure error back to the betting side. And the betting side didn't account for that edge case and didn't register the failed attempt to pay that. So as long as, uh, well, it didn't really matter if you bet on the right team or not, but that's an infinite money glitch. Eh? So it doesn't work only on paid sizes. But of course, uh, it looks all really easy if I uh, explain it like this, but finding the right time and the right place and the right parameter to do this kind of thing can still be challenging. Now, up until now, we basically did not trigger a WAF, so there is no real WAF bypasses uh, here now. But what if you want to use those payloads that could trigger a WAF? What if you want to exploit a SQL injection or an RCE or a path traversal uh, that would always trigger a WAF, so what do you do then? So let's talk about web application firewalls. So normally, uh, in most situations, the web application firewall is placed in front of the gateway API. And it makes sense to place it there because it's basically the guardian at the gate checking all your traffic. And if there's something malicious in there, you don't enter the ecosystem of the API. So the, these WAFs work with pattern recognition, dot, dot, slash for path traversal, sleep for your RCEs or uh, SQL injections or union, or ostify.com, the domain being used by Burp Collaborator to uh, fetch your callbacks that uh, you might get from another uh, uh, application. And as a result of this, there is basically a kind of a trust relationship happening between API 1 and API 2, because API 2, the, at the end of the chain, is basically receiving only washed traffic. Um, API number 2, the developers there might assume, like, all the traffic we get, all the requests that we get, they adhere to some best practices or some standards that are not really written or some business logic or whatever. And they kind of assume that their traffic is clean because they are not publicly reachable or they sit on a whitelisted IP on uh, API 1 or they use bearer tokens and API keys and stuff like that. So there is kind of this trust relationship happening between the two APIs and this might be misplaced trust. So yeah, the WAF in action, very easy. You put a pattern in there that the WAF recognizes, uh, uh, the firewall blocks it, and API number one never receives the traffic, so the call to API two also never happens. This is uh, very well known, I guess. So let's talk about transformations. So transformations are basically ways in which your data can change without actually changing the meaning of the data. So before I explain what transformations are, let's take a look at how your user data travels through this whole ecosystem. So the attacker here submits a JSON ID 123, and first it travels to an HTTP stack, then it enters an API where a JSON parser is handling that data, and it gets put on another HTTP stack, and later on there's another parser, might be an XML parser or a JSON parser or whatever. So there's a lot of different standards and protocols that your data travels through. So let's have a look at these transformations. So every hop, every protocol, every parser you encounter, potentially a transformation can happen. And a transformation is basically a different way of representing your data without actually changing the meaning of the data. So it can be that encodings are being applied or encodings are being reversed, and that's an important one. It can be that characters are replaced by uh, new lines, uh, backslash n or entities. It can be that characters are added, like escape. Things can be stuff like interpretations, like uh, dot, dot, slash, that happens on the HTTP protocol. So, for example, JSON understands Unicode. So we can put our emotion, uh, emojis in, in JSON or uh, Vietnamese or Chinese characters, and there's basically no other way to represent those characters than in Unicode. But what happens if I put the Latin character A in Unicode? So JSON is basically um, triggered. Basically, JSON would want to represent that letter A in the most compatible way possible. 
So JSON, the standard, knows that, okay, JSON understands Unicode, can perfectly read that there's a letter A in there encoded in Unicode, but that is not the most compatible way to represent that data, because you might pull out that data out of the JSON ecosystem, use it in an XML or a URL. So what the JSON parser does, is basically downgrade that Unicode into ASCII. So that's the transformation. The meaning of the letter A hasn't changed. It's just the way the data is represented that's changed. So different uh, protocols, different standards have different ways of transforming data. So we have our uh, all URL uh, related stuff that does percent encoding, your URL part, your get parameters, and so forth. JSON understands Unicode, so you can use Unicode to represent certain ASCII characters. We can have XML, and XML can have entities. Now, most pen testers will be familiar with external entities, which are basically parameters that you can program to contain malicious content. So you can basically say this parameter should represent the contents of uh, etsy pass wd, and whenever that parameter is used, you see the contents of that file. But there are also regular entities, and that's basically the same thing, but hard-coded. So you can't really change the definition of those uh, Parameter. So entities are being used to represent, for example, dangerous characters in XML, like the angled brackets, the quote, the apostrophe, or the euro sign, or whatever. So that are ways to represent that data uh, without changing the meaning of it. But when you pull out a value out of an XML that is represented by an entity and you use it in another structured data format, it will be represented in the most compatible way, which isn't an entity, but is regular ASCII. So now remember our third attack surface. So there is an attack surface that is not API 1 or API 2, but actually the back and forth between the two. Now if you have a situation where an API is using another API, we have a third attack surface so, because something is happening between those two. So let's look at our attacker and whether or not he's submitting ID 123 or he's submitting the Unicode representation of that in backslash U0031 and so on and so on, that basically makes no difference. The first API will receive this request and see, okay, I see you use Unicode but this is not the most compatible way to represent 1, 2, 3. So he will downgrade this to ASCII and use the ASCII value to uh, use the value 1, 2, 3 later on in the path towards the second API. So, and finally, we come to the last chapter of this uh, talk, how we can bypass firewalls with all that we have observed now. We have observed that APIs are using a lot of other APIs, we want to deliver our payloads towards the second order API because they are the most interesting target because of the trust relationship happening there. So we can use these transformations by chaining them and so bypassing the firewall. So a really old example of this is the mother of all chain transformations and as this double URL encoding. And this is so old, uh, yeah, it's really, really old. So basically what happens here is that uh, when you have two HTTP stacks used consecutively, we know that both of them will do a URL decode to represent characters in the most compatible way possible. And because it happens twice, we can use double URL encoding. And our payload will start in a fairly unrecognizable format, passes the first HTTP stack, will de be decoded once, passes the second HTTP stack, will be decoded again, and the payload manifests itself in its malicious form all the way at the end of the chain. Now, lots of tools are capable of doing this. This is nothing new. Um, this is indeed very old technique. But because it's very old, um, buffs are also very capable in detecting it. Um, why? One reason is because it's a very old technique, but another is because we are staying within the same content type and the same encoding type. And for a WAF, it's in terms of CPU cycles and computational effort, fairly cheap to stay within the same encoding type. So a request comes in and a WAF sees that there is a URL encoding in there and says, okay, I want to decode this in order to be able to detect those malicious patterns does the decoding, sees that there's still URL decoding uh, needed in that request. So it just keeps looping that until there are no more URL decodings left. 
And of course, then the uh, payload gets recognized and you have been blocked. And this all happens because we are staying within the same content type or the same encoding type. But what web application firewalls are not aware of is any future content types or future encodings that might happen to your user data. Now, we just saw that your user data is basically following this whole trajectory through different protocols and different standards. The WAF has no idea that this is happening because the request contains no information that your user input later is being used in a totally different content type. So that's where basically uh, the attack comes from. So let's take a look, closer look at this blocked situation. We have our attacker submitting a JSON, one, two, three. We want to perform a path traversal attack here. The WAF blocks it because, uh, yeah, oh, it's a very recognizable payload. So how does this chaining of transformation work? So look at this example. We have our original payload, user ID, one, two, three. And now we want to exploit a path traversal there. So we do dot, dot, slash, and uh, we do five, six, seven. So basically, we want on the second API to end up on a totally different endpoint than the one for our user one, two, three. So we know that JSON understands Unicode, and we know that JSON wants to represent that Unicode in the most compatible way possible. So we just um, the encode our path traversal payload in Unicode. So that would be backslash U, 002F for the hexadecimal code, and so on and so on. Now we can take this one step further and basically not Unicode encode the, uh, the dot and the slash, but we do a Unicode of the percent sign. So we do backslash U0025, which is the hex representation of uh, the Unicode representation of the percent sign. And Unicode has, uh, JSON has absolutely no idea that this literal percent sign that it sees in Unicode has a relationship to these two F characters that come behind it, because inside the JSON ecosystem, this totally has no relationship between each other. So this payload doesn't look anything like the pattern that the WAF has in its memory, the dot, dot slash pattern that it needs to recognize. So what happens? We put the backslash U0025 Unicode representation of the percent sign in that uh, payload, followed by the hexadecimal representation of the uh, slash here in this case. So what happens? There is a JSON parser at API number one. He sees that Unicode and says, okay, I see that you uh, used Unicode to represent the percent sign, but in JSON, percent size can be represented by ASCII, no problem. So the JSON parser is very helpful in decoding and representing the percent sign in its most compatible way in ASCII. So it makes a percent sign of it, and it has no idea that the two characters that come behind it, 2F, will later on have a different meaning and give a me different meaning to that percent sign. So the value 1, 2, 3, percent 2, F, and so on is used to construct a URL path. And the HTTP URL parsing basically manifests the true payload by URL decoding it and interpreting the dot dot slash as a navigational command. And we can exploit this second API. So in a schema here, uh, basically the same situation. So we have our attacker submitting one, two, three with the Unicode representation of the percent sign. And Raf thinks all is okay because it would need multiple decoding cycles to basically recognize this as a malicious payload. And basically decoding cycles that are totally unrelated to the current content type that it sees. And not only that, it has to do it in the correct order too, because if it would do first URL decoding and then Unicode decoding, it would end up nowhere. So this would be computationally very expensive for a web application firewall to perform. And the result is the payload remains undetected. So the first step in this chain, we encounter a JSON parser in our first API, and the Unicode in JSON gets transformed to the most compatible way of representing the percent sign. So basically, it would make uh, API v1, user 1 to 3, and then percent to f, percent to echo, etc., for the path traversal. So the next step is back the HTTP stack, where HTTP transforms the percent encoding, because also that is not the most compatible way of representing a dot and a slash. So that happens. 
HTTP interprets the percent encoding. Voila, so it turns one, two, three, dot, dot, slash, five, six, seven. And what happens in our second API, we have a post to API v1 user 567. And basically, we smuggled our payload using these transformations through the firewall, through the first API, and have it detonate on the second API. So take a look at this bug bounty target. I see we have uh, only a couple minutes left, so let's uh, uh, rush through this. So um, this was a, a GraphQL endpoint a password reset. A uh, user would have gotten a, a code in the mail, used that code to set a new password that was all submitted be, uh, via GraphQL. So first thing you do, of course, is first all the parameters. In this case, the reset code was first with the apostrophe and the quote sign. So what happens, again, those typical symptoms that we see from API to API hacking, we have a 500 server error cropped out of the screen here, but we have here the status 400 parameter indicating that there is one server acting as both as a server and the client. And the error message invalid integer here is not so very important right now because it's uh, about the reset code that is in the post body that we cannot see here. But what's important is that we see ID v2 users and then that UUID alike parameter that we also saw in our original request. So first thing to try, of course, is the vanilla path traversal payload. Um, we tried that, of course, there's a 403 error. Uh, the request could not be satisfied because the WAF has blocked us. So, of course, we try the trick, the Unicode trick, and represent that path traversal as a Unicode uh, inside JSON. Now, we could have also used the percent encoding here, but it wasn't needed, so it wasn't done, but the example still stands. And what happens here, we have a status 404, which is normally not good, but in this case, you can see that the leaked internal uh, uh, API domain and the path behind this ID v2 and the path user has been disappeared, so that means our path traversal is basically working. So, of course, from there on out, you just traverse all the way back up to the web route and start brute forcing the second day API for its specs and, and see what uh, valid paths are, can be discovered. And sooner or later, you find something. In this case, it was a 405, the first uh, hit that we got, which also not great news, but still not bad news because it means the resource actually exists. It's just that we arrive at it with the wrong HTTP method. Um, this was a post, should have been a get, but at least you know that the concept is working. And for the observant attendee, you see that there was also a hard-coded path here, lifecycle reset pass password that we needed to get rid of. So we used, instead of the pound sign that we used in the earlier bugs, we used the, uh, the question mark here to dump that hard-coded suffix path in the, in the uh, uh, query part of the URL to basically get rid of it. So from there on out, that you know that you have valid endpoints that you can hit, it's just a matter of brute forcing and finding the layout of that second API. So to conclude, basically, how you exploit that bug is left uh, as an exercise for the attendee. But we've seen now that um, APIs are the glues between services. And APIs, using APIs are fairly common. It's not like you encounter it every time, but it happens. So APIs are the glue between services, and second-order APIs have a trust relationship with the first-order API because they only receive whitewashed traffic, check traffic, uh, according to a business logic that is uh, pre-agreed upon and stuff like that. So that second API is definitely the most important, I mean, the most interesting target for us as pen testers. So we want to deliver our payloads to those second-order APIs. And the properties of that architecture, with all the protocols and standards that's following each other, it basically given the pen tester the tools to pre-obfuscate your payload according to the hops that are being taken. And if you do that, then the WAF really has no chance in detecting your payload, and you can sneak past the WAF, you can sneak past the first API, and have your payloads detonating in the second API. Now, I used a lot of path traversal here, that's because it fits nicely on, on a slide, but you can 
uh, use this technique basically for any kind of bug. It can be a SQL injection, or it can be an RCE, or you could even pre-obfuscate uh, uh, deserialization bugs or something like that. But if I have to do that on a slide, it would be, uh, yeah, nobody would understand that. So basically, that was the talk. But I have one more slide that I want to give you. Um, as I said, the CCP, the government, is not here to uh, keep an eye on you, but to encourage you to hack even more. And that's why, because of that new CVDP law that the government wrote that gives ethical hackers some form of protection when they are ethical hacking, we basically want to celebrate this fact by hacking the government. So, in collaboration with Integrity, they were so kind to uh, lend us their platform, we are organizing a CVDP-oriented live hacking event. And basically, we want to celebrate the fact that we can hack in Belgium without going to jail if you adhere to a certain set of rules. But this set of rules, if you are truly of good intent, you wouldn't have to change your process because it just flows naturally. You cannot exploit these bugs. Uh, with malicious intent, you cannot um, uh, reserve a whole plane for yourself and then actually go on it or uh, stuff like that. So if that's the case, we cannot help you. But if you hack something with good intentions and you just prove that the vulnerability exists without actually downloading all the data and stuff like that, this law is there to protect the ethical hackers. And we at the CCB, we really value these ethical hackers doing that. And I think in the audience there are yeah, at least a couple of ethical hackers here that are here on the invite of the CCB that got on their BrewCon ticket from because they submitted something to the CVDP program. So we at the CCB, we really leave no stone unturned to show our gratitude to the people spending time to make Belgium safer for everybody. So we really recognize that there's a lot of talent here in Belgium and we want to use that. And I want to specifically thank the people from Integrity because they share that vision. They also are aware that people need to start hacking if you want to end up with a very secure country. So that's why we organizing end of November um, Hack the Government uh, live hacking event. And the goal is to mix very uh, experienced researchers with just hobbyists or students or people who just want to begin. We want a real healthy mix so we can mingle and it's basically a real feel-good event where we can basically celebrate the fact that we just can hack and not go to jail. And I think that's a real milestone that we are past here as the only country in the world that has it. So I think that's something uh, we can be really proud of. I mean, we complain a lot about our governments and our lots of governments, but this is actually a good thing, so that can be said too. So we have lots of government-issued awards, lots of prizes, governmental targets, and students and experienced researchers can mix and mingle. And uh, So if you want to apply for this event, uh, we have quite a large venue available, so uh, uh, find us at the CCB booth and register yourself and uh, yeah, we'll be happy to tell you all about the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Law and get you hacking. Yeah, so well, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, maybe in the second room, do you have questions? If there is no questions... Yes, please. Yeah. So, the only solution would be to, to make the data validation on the first API, right? Um, yeah, uh, uh, I'll repeat the question. So the only solution you ask would be to uh, do the data validation on the first API. Yes, that is true. Well, basically the best starting position to have is not having any vulnerability. So indeed, that uh, input validation is super important. But practice learns us that this is very hard to do, especially when you're dealing with complex legacy system code bases that you might have inherited from somewhere. So, yes, indeed, that would be the ideal starting position. But if that's not the case, personally, but it's a personal opinion, I think our procedure where you have a secure uh, coding lifecycle, you do your internal testing, and then you maybe have uh, an external pen testing team come in, test your system, and if all that 
has happened, then you might get the bug bounty program or a responsible disclosure policy and have the ethical hackers had a go on it. If all this has happened, I think basically that would be also a way to discover these very hidden vulnerabilities. I don't think it's a problem of uh, procedure, it's a problem of not having a lot of people that can do this. So it's a, more of a, a lack of human resources rather than the procedure. So uh, that's why we want people to be able to hack and uh, learn how to hack so that we at least can solve this uh, shortage in talent. Right, if you have later any questions or something, just come find me at the booth and... Uh, Ah, yes, uh, one more thing I have to mention, that's uh, some internal communication here. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, ethical hackers here that have already submitted something to the CVDP and are here on the invite of the CVDP. I would like to invite you to come over at, uh, at the CCB booth because we have an extra bag of goodies for you and so we can meet and uh, finally in real life. And uh, yeah, thank you again in person for participating in the, in the CVDP. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.